Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm here with two authors, Lisa McMahon and Joanne Levy. Lisa McMahon is the author of the Unwanted series and she has a new book coming out, Clarice the Brave. And Joanne Levy also has a new book coming out called Sorry for Your Loss. Thank you so much for coming here. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. Uh, so I have, I have a lot of questions for the both of you. <laughs> so I guess you could just win whichever order you two want to answer. But I know you guys both know each other. So how did you guys end up meeting? We met so you want to take that? Yeah. Um, so we met at a conference called Backspace. Um, I think it was 2009. Does that sound right? Right. Uh, it was a long time ago. I don't remember the actual year. Yeah, we we kind of knew each other online at, through the Backspace uh, message boards before then, but we actually met in person at the conference. 2009 sounds about right. I think so, because my first book was just out. Wake was out. Or else it was just about to come out. I'm not No, sure. No, because you had the signing at Books of Wonder. Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah. So that would have been 2008 is when Wake came out. So it would have been somewhere between there and. So around 13 years ago. Something like that. Yeah. A long time. <laughs> it is. And how long have you guys been working together? Because I know you guys like work together a little bit here and there. How long have yeah. you guys like really started working together? So we work together in the capacity of, I help Lisa with admin work. Um, I come from a background of um, banking, but I was an executive assistant to a VP. So back when I had a, a day job, um, Lisa was sort of looking for some help with her admin stuff. And I said, hey, maybe I can help. Um, and that's pretty much where it started. I don't even remember when that was. Do you, Lisa? No, long time ago. It was a long um, time. So we've been working together for many years. I want to say probably 10. Oh, at least, because I left the bank. It had to be eight years ago, and we'd been working together. Um, I worked together, worked with Lisa part-time, and then uh -huh. when I left the bank eight years ago, uh, I went full-time with admin assisting for other authors as well. Um, so yeah, it's probably at least 10 years, I would say. 10 years. Long enough that we know each other pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you both are writers. How long have you both been writing? Like, I mean, you've probably been writing a long time since you were kids in school, but like, how long have you been professionally writing? For me, it was around 2002 that I picked up writing again. I had tried getting published right out of college mm -hmm. and I, I gave up after a while because it was so hard and I had got so many no's and I just wasn't ready for that in my life at that time. Yeah. But in about, I think it was 2002, my kids were old enough to like be able to make themselves a meal. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, I don't know, eight and five or something <laughs> like that. They could take care of themselves so I could actually sit down at the computer and write for a half hour at a time or something like that. So, um, yeah, so I think my first publication was a short story and in a magazine, and it probably didn't pay anything. Mm -hmm. But um, in 2004, I think, is when I really started to submit a lot more stories and, and get paid for them. And for me, it was probably maybe a bit later than that. I, I always wrote part-time um, when I had a day job. Um, actually, maybe even before that, but little bits, dribs and drabs here and there. Um, uh -huh. But I, I gave up a few times just because it would, like Lisa says, it's, it's hard. It's hard to break in. Um, um, but I think I started taking it really seriously, probably about 2007 or eight. And I sold my first book, uh, 2010. So, okay. So that's a while of writing. Uh, what made you want to write professionally? I wanted to, um, well, it, it's kind of a long story, but I was working as a realtor 
So I was selling houses to people um, and I really loved doing that. But one day my boss came in and said, you are here working so much. Do you have any hobbies or maybe you can get one? And I thought about writing again, which I had given up on um, mm -hmm. years before. And so I, I started writing, you know, for fun at first, just as a hobby. And, uh, but that's what made me think about writing again was my boss just in that offhand comment, you know, um, and that's, yeah, that's how that happened. Isn't that funny how just, just a thrown out comment can make that happen for, for me, it was, I had a, a job that I had a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, working with um, another person and we were running sort of a mobile employment center and there were times where we were just sitting waiting for people to come. We had lots and lots of time. So I just started mm -hmm. fiddling around with stories. Um, but then I found it was addictive writing <laughs> and telling stories. And, yeah. and I just really enjoyed doing it. And it sort of went back to when I was a, a kid, like your age, and I wrote lots of stories for school and really enjoyed doing them. Um, I just love telling stories. And so then I started to take it a lot more seriously and want to get published so that I could share my stories with other people. So you started writing, right? So now both of you guys have lots of different books out and you both have new books coming out uh, and they're both coming out on the same day this year. Did you tell that, did you guys tell each other that or was that like a, did that end up like, did you see what did one of you schedule your book in advance? Then you're like, Oh, maybe I'll as a surprise, I'll do it too. Or was it, <laughs> mutual or like did it just so happen that both of you picked the same day wouldn't that have been fun if we had done that on purpose lisa <laughs> that would have been that would have been really neat in fact we'd probably do it every time yeah um but actually we don't have anything to do with the scheduling that's all up to the publisher so uh -huh. usually when the publisher buys a book from an author it takes about two years from the time they make an offer on the book on the manuscript till the time it's out on the bookshelf. And then um, maybe about nine months or a year before the book comes out, they are already planning the date uh -huh. and they the date. And then sometimes they tell us, and sometimes we find out about it by, you know, looking online and go, Oh, Hey, <laughs> that's when my book's coming out. Uh -huh. And I forget who approached who when when we both what we both realized our books are coming out on the same day. Let's do something together. But yeah, it was it was a total surprise, and we're published with completely different publishers, so it was uh -huh. a completely just a serendipitous thing that it was just completely it was just co completely coincidental. Yep, yep. Well, maybe the stars knew something about it. Maybe decided we should launch together that's yeah. really cool yeah, because there's so many days and it just so happens that both of yours are coming out in the same day yep okay so now going back again to words when you started to write what was like your what was like an aha moment where you're like hey you know i can maybe just maybe i can just become an author becoming an author can be my new thing what was your mo what was your moment that you're like okay I've decided at least, at least like part-time, I'm going to commit to being an author. Lisa? Um, for me, it was when I won an award in 2004 for a mm -hmm. short story. And it was um, a lot of money, which never happens. And uh -huh. you know, it, it was this international contest there were 20 or 25 winners and they would each get a, you know, different amount of money or whatever. Yeah. And it was on a certain topic. And so I wrote a short story to match the topic and I got a phone call in August of 2004 saying, you have won $10,000. Oh, wow. A short story, which is just ridiculous. I mean, I've never heard this contest has never happened again. It was a one time thing. And um, it was at that point, you know, I, I got this check for $10,000. And I thought and we were about to move 
we're moving uh-huh. from Michigan to Arizona. And I thought, maybe this is my nest egg. This is my little money to try and live on with my husband. You know, he's, he yeah. had his job and stuff. So he was providing for the family. Um, but this is my backup emergency fund just in case. And I'm going to try and write. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, I wrote two novels right after that, that did not sell. Um, mm-hmm. And then my third one did. And for me, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I honestly, I don't, I don't remember. Um, I just started writing and kept at it and kept at it. And, and I'm stubborn and just, yeah, I wanted to keep writing. And I don't know if there was an aha moment. I think it was just something I decided to do and I enjoyed. Then is there anything that you would consider like your, what was like your very first success success thing like writing that you felt the most accomplished about which you were like okay wow this is the major success I'm an author now sort of that validation yeah um you know what there's been so many steps along the way I don't know that I remember a very specific one early on but I remember signing with my first agent was very validating um Uh knowing that I wasn't just writing for myself, um, you know, or a friend who would like my writing. Somebody that I don't even know that isn't related to me said, you have something and I'd like to try and sell it for you. So that's that's really validating. Um, But I think that a lot of writers were pretty self-motivated and we just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. And we kind of have to, right? Lisa, you love writing. Yeah, you love writing, love telling stories. And, you know, it. sometimes it's more important just to to get out what we're thinking and get the yeah. story out than it is to publish it and make a gazillion dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's nice too, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would have kept going and going if my third book that I wrote hadn't gotten published, I would have just kept going. And I think that's the best, you know, the best thing you can do is... If you're writing, a a lot of people start writing a novel and then they keep working at that same novel over and over again for years and years and years. And that could work. That could be the right thing for certain people. There's no one right way to do it. But I do think that it was the best thing for me to try to get something published. And as I'm trying to find an agent or get that published, work on something else. And I think that helps with just how exhausting this job can be sometimes when when you have to wait all the time. Because that's what we do a lot of. We are, it's a lot of waiting, a lot of no's, a lot of people saying no to us, you know, nope, that's not good enough. Nope, I'm not interested. That's not the book for me. Sorry, good luck you know, and so you kind of have to learn how to absorb all of that and then also continue and keep working at your craft and getting better and better. And keep moving forward. And, and that's, uh, I mean, a lot of people give up after they write one book and they think, Oh, some, nobody wants it, but with every book you get better. And with every book, you have a better chance of, finding that perfect thing that the market wants or that an agent wants or that, you know, that, that people are going to want from you or the, the perfect story for you to write. Yeah. Um, Lisa knows this, but not everybody does that. My first book was, I think my 14th that I'd written. Right. So it's, yeah, really, it's not your first book that might sell. It may not be your second book, but maybe your 14th. Yeah. 14th. But if it's worth it to you and you love the process and you love writing, it's totally worth it. Totally worth it. Because sure. like at the end of the day, I mean, even if the books don't sell, at least at least you have uh, at least you have something that it made you better over the course of time. Yes. No writing is ever wasted. Even I if agree. it never sees the light of day, it's never wasted. I agree 100%. Every word you write is, you know, it's not just, I'm just going to throw this away. 
it, you might want to throw it away and you can, um, but it, you learned something from that. And I think that's really important to remember as writers too, that, you know, we might feel like we're going nowhere for some time, but every, and it's just like, you know, being an athlete or you yeah. know, playing sport, you need the practice in order to get better. You mm -hmm. can't just immediately be the best in your sport or in your craft or your art. Um, it just takes time. So you said like, there's a lot of waiting in writing. There's a lot of publishers telling you no, yes, lots of negotiations. How scary was it your first time publishing a book, like first time going to a publisher? What was running through your mind? What did you think? Did you think you were ready enough? What did you realize? Well, the nice thing about having an agent is that the agent is the one who pitches the book to the, the editors at the publishing houses. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of sit back and wait for a report. How did they like it? Did, did anybody want, you know, is anybody talking about it? Is anybody interested? Does anybody want to buy it? And, um, you know, it, that can be excruciating too. It, you know, it can be really hard yeah. to be the one pitching your story to an editor because you can mm -hmm. be intimidated. Um, not, you don't know them, you know, you don't know these people at all personally. Yeah. So it's really difficult, but thankfully with an edit, with an agent, they do all that kind of stuff, but it's still hard because you're sitting here in your house trying to focus on writing the next thing in case uh -huh. this one doesn't sell but waiting for some news. And sometimes that takes months and months, really long time. <laughs> it's it, yeah. And it, it is excruciating. I mean, imagine sitting, looking at your phone constantly like this, <laughs> waiting for the call, waiting uh -huh. for the call for months and months. And every time your email, you know, pings and, and is this going to be it? Is this going to be it? Um, and sometimes, you know, the call or the email is they didn't want it. Or they bought something just like it, or they didn't feel it was ready, or the market doesn't want something like, you know, there's a lot of rejection. Um, but as much rejection as there is, it only takes one yes. Exactly. You know? So it can turn into the best phone call ever. But it is excruciating waiting. It's still excruciating waiting, isn't it, Lisa? Like, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it doesn't. I'm working on a brand new series. And, uh -huh. um, you know, it's like, I'm writing book two, or I've, I've already written book two of it and I haven't even been able to announce it yet. So this is a little fun fact for your viewers that, um, mm -hmm. I've got a brand new, like fantasy kind of series coming. Yes. Yeah. And, but the thing is, I like been so waiting to tell people about it because uh -huh. we don't have cover quite yet. We're a little bit behind on the covers. They've been through a couple of different artists now trying to find the right one yeah. for the new series. And so, you know, that's, it's, it's waiting for someone to buy it. It's waiting for that publishing date to finally come. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't wait. I have been waiting so long for Clarice the Brave to come out because I, you know, I started working on it years ago um so it's just yeah a lot of that how many uh your first book that got published and maybe your books in general that go out <clears throat> how many people that how many people would you say you show it to before you show it to the publishers lisa um uh, for the first book more it was maybe a handful maybe mm -hmm. six or maybe eight. Um, but for books now, my husband reads it and then I turn it into my editor. So that's it. But I used to need more feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm starting to, I mean, with book number 27, I'm finally feeling like I don't need to show it to a bunch of people anymore. Yeah. But, yeah. You got it. You got this. Maybe, just maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Although I have to say, every time I start a new book, I'm like, how do I do this again? <laughs> how about you, Joanne? Um, it used to be more. I used to be a member of critique groups where we would, other writers, we would trade manuscripts back and forth and help each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like 
generally speaking, I need less of that these days, but certain, certain books like this, this new one, Sorry for Your Loss, I was so concerned about getting it right um, and making sure that I hit all the right points. And um, it's just such a personal, important book to me that I sent it out several times to different writer friends. Um, my dad read it twice. Uh, my dad, I don't even know if he's read most of my books, um, really? but he's, he's actually, he manages a funeral home. So oh, it was okay. inspired by him. So I wanted that to make sense. sure that I got the details right. So he read it twice. I had a bunch of other friends. I think I had probably eight or nine people read this book um, before mm -hmm. or in between sending it to my editor. Um, but normally I wouldn't. Normally I wouldn't. I, I've had a couple of recent books that I haven't shown to anybody. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fine. It depends on the book. But I think you get to a certain stage where you trust your writing yeah. and you have good instincts and you know. Um, but there's always people out there that'll help if, if you feel like you need a sensitivity reader or, or just fresh eyes. <clears throat> Yeah. And I forgot, Joanne, that you read Clarice the Brave before we sent that out to publishers as well. So I did I did uh, have Joanne look at that one just because I was different. very lucky. Yeah. I was very, very lucky because I, I normally don't read Lisa's books early on, but I think because it was a different book for you. And yeah, that was. Fun. Yeah, I was actually my next question was going to be, have you guys read each other's books that are about to come out? Have you read Sorry for Your Loss? Lisa? Yes, I have. Um, I read that one early on. I was one of your eight or nine or whatever. Um, and uh, I just reread the finished version. Mm -hmm. And it's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And ditto, I read the early copy of Clarice the Brave. And I also just read the final version um, and agree that it's wonderful. Same thing. I mean, you I've read them it. both, and I also agree that they're both really good. Thank you. Thank you. So Hi. I know, uh, Joy, you talked a little bit about it, um, Elisa, because if you look at, like, your other books, for me personally, because reading The Unwanted then Clarice the Brave, they're, like, they're a little different. <clears throat> so, and Joy, you said your father runs a funeral home, but is what gave you guys the inspiration to write these books? Go ahead, Joanne. Um, yeah, like I said, my dad um, runs a funeral home. And this book came about kind of in a weird way in that originally I was going to um, write a companion book to my debut. So my debut is called Small Medium at Large. And it's about a girl who gets hit by lightning and can then hear ghosts. Um, so I thought it would be fun to write a book set in a funeral home where Lila, who's in the in small, medium at large, meets this kid who works in his family's funeral home. Mm -hmm. So I went and did the research and did a tour of the funeral home and looked around behind the scenes and everything. Um, but it just it didn't it wasn't working because it felt like it was kind of it's heavy topics. Yeah. And I didn't want to make light of grief and loss and losing somebody mm -hmm. so the tone of the book wasn't working and I was really really struggling and so then back in 2013 I lost my mom and when she died I had done this research at the funeral home and I felt weirdly comforted by what I knew and it seems so weird like it, it was the worst day it was terrible but I still felt a bit of peace knowing how she would be cared for at the funeral home. Yeah. And it occurred to me, not many people have that access to know what happens at a funeral home and to be comforted. So I completely pivoted after that. And it took a while for me to settle on how I wanted to, to write the book and where I wanted to take it. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my big inspiration for that was sort of that pivoting from a comedy book to something a little more real that might have a bit of comedy in it, but um, overall, more overall so. was something completely different than my original intent. So that's where that came from. For Clarice the Brave, um, originally I wrote the first one or two chapters somewhere when I was writing 
the end of the first unwanted series or the beginning of the second unwanted series. Uh huh. Uh, I just had this idea. I'd always wanted to um, write. I love the sea. I love stories that take place on ships. I always have, you know, in the unwanted, yeah. I've got them on a ship all the time. They're oh yeah, they're constantly the crossing islands. Exactly. I love writing about that. And but I always, I think I got that love from some of the books I read when I was young, mm-hmm. uh, a teenager, like Mutiny on the Bounty which is a true story of a mutiny. Uh, It's not a true story. That's a fictional story of the actual happenings of Captain Bly in the late 1700s, uh, where he was set adrift in a launch boat um, with some other sailors because all the, the other sailors on the ship hated him. And he was a terrible captain, according to them. And so... I always imagined what would it be like if there was like a family of mice and some of them got stuck with the captain, got thrown into the captain's launch boat, but some of them remained on the ship. And how could they possibly ever find each other again? Yeah. And so that was the original, it was inspired by, you know, the Captain Bly story, the mutiny Mm -hmm. story, but also I loved books like Watership Down and The Incredible Journey, which became a movie called Homeward Bound, if yeah. anybody knows that, um, but about the two dogs and a cat who are trying to find their family again. I just loved that animal journey story. So that was the original inspiration. Uh, but then about two or three years ago, you know, I'd only had those couple chapters, mm-hmm. but then I started to hear about all of the um, kids who were being separated from their parents at the Southern border of the United States. And as a mom, I can't even imagine having my children taken away from me as I'm trying to get to safety in a, in a different country. Yeah. And that just broke my heart. And I felt like there was nothing I could do to fix that. But I thought, this reminds me so much of this separation story of these mice. You know, they're being pulled apart on these different ships. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the the Clarice and and Charles Sebastian are ship mice. And one of them, Clarice, gets thrown onto this ship or this separate launch boat with the captain. Yeah, with the captain. And a cat. And, uh, you know, and suddenly that act that happened a few years ago and it's still you know it continued um that was sort of like a catalyst or it was something that made me think i need to write this story now and so that's when i really took i took a summer and wrote the whole rough draft um and that's how that happened um what would you say is both of your guys's favorite parts of your upcoming books. Is there a specific portion that you, you just really like reading again, that you feel like I really, really did a great job writing this. (laughs) You know, I think I'm really proud of, or um, I, there's a couple things. I love the scenes toward the end where it's really high stakes and there's a lot of action happening, Mm -hmm. but I'm also really proud of, um, the relationships. Clarice has to make an unlikely friendship because of the circumstances she's in. That's and the same with Charles Sebastian back on the ship. Yeah. It's sort of an unlikely friendship. And the development of those friendships is something I'm quite proud of. And, and I would say sort of the same for me um, with Evie and Oren. They're, they're very reluctant friends um they're coming at it for a couple different reasons um but i love writing kids getting to know each other and becoming friends um i'm not going to give you any spoilers for any of your watchers um of any of the specifics of the relationships but there is one part that just of the book that makes me laugh and laugh and it's so ridiculous and it's the paper shredder if you remember 
anyway, it's so ridiculous and it's just like a tiny thing, but it just makes me laugh and laugh. So that's my favorite part of the book. And Lisa's looking at the screen like, I don't remember anything about a paper shredder. <laughs> I remember the paper shredder. And honestly, I'm like drawing a blank on the paper shredder. Now I have to go back and do a word. Well, word. we can discuss offline. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a page number. It's so, it's such a tiny little thing and probably readers would be not even notice it, but it's just one of those silly things that <laughs> we put in that make us entertain. So that's my favorite part of the book. You know, I feel that sometimes because I was just writing an essay for Lord of the Flies, which I hate that book. It's terrible. I love that book. No, it's like, it's so, I don't like analyzing it. Sometimes we spend like, two whole classes analyzing four pages and it's just it's a lot but like because then I was going over my uh essay with my teacher and I read like my first I read my first uh body paragraph and I was like whoa that's really really good and then I read my next two I was like whoa that's not so good (laughs) yeah but but then I was like wait Uh, But I was like, my first one was really really good though I felt like happy I was like okay that was a good first paragraph You sound like a real writer. (laughs) You do sound like a real writer. That's awesome. (laughs) Um, What what was the toughest part of writing both of these books? For me, it was probably... um, For the possibility of two mice finding each other separated uh-huh. by the sea figuring out the logistics of whether that can actually happen or not um, yeah because you don't want to because this isn't like an unwanted type book it's like more or less realistic fiction like sort of like we're just assuming that like mice can talk other than that the circumstances are like real world circumstances yes so figuring out like, where are they? And is this, a, I, I mean, I don't really identify the location because that is sort of made up, mm-hmm. but I did do a lot of research on islands and, you know, different, you know, vessels and all that kind of stuff um, too. So I, I would think, I think the probably getting the logistics down of where are these two ships going in different directions and what happens, you know, how can we put this together? You know, cause there's no seek spells in this book. No. So <laughs> they can't just find each other like that. That is correct. And for me, the, the hardest thing about this book um, is what I think made it as good as I think it is, which is the fact that if it wasn't for my mom dying, I never would have written it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of bittersweet that, you know, not that I had to lose her to write this book, but I think you know what I mean. Like without her passing, this book wouldn't exist. But at the same time, I know she's out there somewhere going, yes, you did it, you know, and she's she's in like every page. So it's it made it hard to do edits it made it hard to read it over and over again because it's, yeah. you know, it's emotional, even though the readers don't know, um, I know, and yeah. she's there. So that was that was hard. It's probably the hardest book I've ever written um, for that reason, but the one I'm most proud of too. And is there anything that you're most excited that you that that you're most excited for the readers to see in this book or is there something that you specifically feel like you're really excited for the readers to after reading this you'll they'll be like you know I really identified with this part and you're like yes I knew that was going to happen for I guess for uh for me for Clarice the Brave I do think that my unwanted readers are going to like this book Mm -hmm. it's a little different and it's most likely a standalone but, um, you know, I think they're going to they're going to see the action in this story and make maybe it will feel somewhat familiar just because of the ship, yeah. you know, and we do have some talking animals in the unwanted as well. So, yeah, I mean, we they're do. statues, but they look like animals. Exactly. But there's so much heart 
in Clarice the Brave that I think uh, that it's going to, your readers are going to love that because that's what they love about The Unwanted. It's it's not necessarily the fantasy stuff. It's so much heart in your books. Yeah, so, there's so many different the relationships in the book too, just like in Clarice the Brave. There's so many different relationships that were formed in The Unwanted. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I do love writing that, I, that kind of thing, that just to try and get deep inside the the soul and the heart of the character. And so I hope that if that's what, you know, people really liked about the unwanted, um, that character development and the relationships, I think they'll see that coming through in Clarice the Brave as well. Um, and, you know, Joanne, your friendship development in Sorry for Your Loss is incredible. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why um, that book got a starred review from Kirkus. I mean, that's really difficult to get a starred review from Kirkus, especially Kirkus is a reviewer that can tend to be a little bit snarky. (laughs) And uh, they loved your book and I did too. And I just felt the heart, like I just felt... And the progression was just brilliant. And, and I love how you start with so much awkwardness. I mean, you're really good at awkwardness. How are you so good at that? You've met me, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I'm awkward. I don't know. I, I think that I take what I would naturally do and don't filter it. So I think, I think the awkward is me at that age and me at this age, but without the filter. So thank you. Thank you for calling me awkward. (laughs) And I say that because a lot of writers are awkward in different ways. You know, a lot of us are introverted and we, we say things that sound good in our heads because we're writing a story in our heads uh-huh. constantly about what's happening right now in our lives. And then we say this thing out loud and we realize that was a weird mm-hmm. thing to say. And that's just really normal, I think, for writers. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for the plug about the Kirkus star. Oh, I'll, I'll okay. send your check tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. Yeah. You're me? Yay. <laughs> That's different. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to take a little detour from Chloe's to Brave and Sorry for Your Loss. And I do want, I have a few questions about Unwanted. And first, uh, Joanne, have you read the whole, have you read the whole Unwanted series? So, so you know that Lisa has 27 books, right? Mm -hmm. So... (laughs) This is where things get awkward. Um, No, I haven't read them all. And I I think Lisa probably knows that. I knew that. Yeah. I I never, I think the important thing as an author to do is to never expect anyone has read your books. Once you start assuming people are reading my books and I'm pretty well read, you know, everybody's reading stuff. The, The second you start doing that, the, that's when you start turning into kind of a jerk. Yes. So the important thing I think is to assume no one has read your work ever. And I would never have expected you to have read 14 books in the same world that we just don't have time for that. It's, and that's the thing, like it, in my own, my own excuse for that is that I am an extremely slow reader. Um, Some people, assume that authors are speed readers and because we're working with words all day and we're writing, I am not a fast reader. I'm a really, really slow reader and I have a terrible memory. So if I was going to read say book six of Lisa's series, as it comes out, I need to go back and read one, two, three, because I, I've forgotten everything. Uh-huh. Um, and that's not a testament of how good her books are. I, I don't remember what I wrote yesterday of my own book. 
So it's, it's difficult. I do own all of Lisa's books. So I would like credit for that. You get lots of credit for that. And you've also bought multiple copies and have given them away. I know many times. So I am very satisfied with that situation. Thank you. So Kirkus Review, we mentioned them. So like the top quote of that I always see in the first book is, is like the Hunger Games meets Harry Potter. And I mean, I think I'm a big Harry Potter fan. I have a fireball hanging right there. Oh, you do. Oh, that's and awesome. So obviously, and when reading the books, it did obviously remind me of Harry Potter and Hunger Games because the dystopian setting with the magic. Did you act, because this has always just been the top review on the book. Did you take inspiration from those or did it just so happen that as you created this book, it happened to be somewhat as a joint between these two? Um, I, I had read a few of the Harry Potter books by the time I started writing The Unwanted. And, but the Hunger Games hadn't even come out yet. So, yeah. um, but my, I did take some inspiration from different books. I loved mm -hmm. the Chronicles of Narnia and I actually read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe before I started writing, because I knew that was the kind of storytelling I wanted to do. So I wanted to get kind of the, the, the voice uh -huh. in my head by reading that book and then going immediately into writing the first Unwanted's book. Um, and I wasn't really even thinking about magic at all when I started writing uh, The Unwanted's. Yeah. But then I kind of came to a point where I'm like, after the first few chapters, I thought, how am I going to get these kids out of this situation? You know, uh -huh. how are we going to save Alex's life here? And I thought, you know, I do love the magic from Narnia. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of pulled my family and we got together and sat all together in the living room and started talking about spells and mm -hmm. how can we make all of the spells or most of the spells art related and it just kind of went from there but i it was it was um narnia but also the giver was my dystopian influence had you read any of the percy jackson books i have never Before. read a percy jackson book isn't that terrible i appreciate them very much i know that my readers love those books as well mm -hmm. And I think Rick Riordan is a fantastic person. Um, I just have never read any because I didn't want my books, my Unwanted series to be too much like Percy Jackson. I didn't want to yeah. accidentally like steal from his stories. So that's kind of something that is unfortunate with writers. We sometimes have to stay away from books that are similar to ours in order to not be influenced by them. Um. So I know the Unwanted, obviously, it's your most popular series. It is, it is a, it's a fairly, fairly big series, has a pretty large fan base. And the books in the series as a whole have collected dozens of awards. How does that feel as an author? Like, how did that feel when you got the first one versus when you got the last one? Was there a difference? How'd you feel? I mean, I think the first award is always validation. It feels yeah. like, oh, phew, you know, this book is pretty good or somebody thinks yeah. it is anyway. Um, but then when, like it took, it, it went over so many years, there were different states that would put it on their state reading list. And uh, yeah. I know you're in, in Missouri and uh, it won an award there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the first ones, I think. One of the first big ones where it won the, the uh, Mark Twain Award. Um, and I yeah. think it was just a couple of years after that first book came out that that happened. But it was wonderful. I mean, and it won awards in other states too, California, um, uh, Connecticut. So uh, across the country, it just kind of feels like, 
you know, this is, this is incredible that there are so many kids out there who are voting for this book. It mm-hmm. meant so much to me. And it does every time there's something else happening with it. I'm just feel so lucky. And I feel so happy about it that especially when it's kids who are voting and creating, yeah. you know, making this happen. Those, those kids choice awards um, mean more than anything. I mean, for me anyway, I, I, yeah. I think a lot of authors will say the same thing that, you know, it's one thing to have a bunch of librarians or adults um, pick your book for something, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But when kids are reading and voting and getting so excited, I mean, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Nothing like it. Have you had any plans to make a third unwanted series or have you as a plan or are you thinking maybe somewhere along the line you might pick it back up at this point i don't think there will be any more unwanted books i mm-hmm. feel like in my talking with the publisher that we felt like this was a good place to be done yeah um if they ever decide they want to do more they can contact me. Um, if I ever decide I want to do more, I can check in with them and see if they're interested. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I would love to see someday is uh, like a graphic novel of The yeah. Unwanted. I think that would be so cool, but I don't know how to write those. That's a different mm-hmm. style of writing, a different kind of writing that I don't feel like I can do. Mm-hmm. So someone else would have to do it. And it's, it's such a labor intensive um, venture to make a graphic novel. Yeah. You've got an illustrator who's got time to do that kind of um, intense work. And it I takes the amount years. of detail, especially with like books like that, the amount yeah. of detail with the little magic, with the characters that you want to put in is it's pretty hard. So many characters too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so by the end, I mean. I mean, almost every book has like a massive final <laughs> yeah. battle. So. Yeah, yeah that it, it does. Uh, man, I, there's over a hundred characters by by the time we got to the end. Probably more than 120 or 130. Uh huh. That was a lot. And. There are lots of rumors. I know they're not true, but have you had any talks with anybody about possibly making an unwanted movie? I have had talks with different companies. There is not a movie deal in the works at Mm -hmm. all at this time. Um, But I would love to see something happen there, like a movie or even... uh, you know, something on Netflix or something like that, any kind of streaming um, TV show. show. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be great. It, it is a hard, fantasy is always difficult um, because it is very expensive to yes. make fantasy series. Um, whether you need CGI or animation, it's very labor intensive. So that's, you know, I don't, I don't know that there will ever be a movie or a TV show or anything like that, but I'm always willing to talk to people in the industry in Hollywood who are interested in, in making something for sure. So yeah. if they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're listening. Yes. Yeah. Cause I don't know if you heard, but Rick, cause obviously the Percy Jackson movies, they made two and then they kind of stopped it because they didn't really, it wasn't a great ending. The, the movies didn't have a great run, but then what, because I think Rick Ryden is published, he uses Disney Hyperion as, so they are doing a Disney Plus series and they're yeah. taking like each of the books and they're making it an episode. Oh, that's so cool. I wasn't sure how they were going to do it, but I'd heard about that. And yeah. So, I mean, maybe they could do something similar for the unwanted. That'd be great. Or like, instead of like seven movies, you can make like seven books into like 14 episodes. I mean, if they can do it for Game of Thrones, they can do it for Unwanted. Yeah, I agree. Let's do that. They stretched it to like eight seasons, I'm pretty sure, with Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. Although the last season wasn't great, but anyway. 
<laughs> yeah, there was a whole petition to like remake it. <laughs> really? That's funny. I've only seen one episode of Game of Thrones. Uh, so I again have, so I just have my last two questions, which again are broad questions. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is wanting to become an author? Go ahead, Joanne. Um, number one, read, 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 um, and read widely, even if it's books you don't necessarily, um, if it's not in the genre you normally read, read anyway, so that you can yeah. learn from what other people have done. Um, and it's, it's a lot of practice. I mean, you, you don't, concert pianists don't walk up to a piano and, you know, know everything the first time they sit at a piano. It takes oh, yeah. work. Um, so just don't be in a big rush. I know it's hard. It's writers, I think, are impatient because we're go getters, but um, read lots and write lots. Hopefully, I stole Lisa's answer. What are you going to say? Oh, no. <laughs> what are you gonna say? Um, okay, so here's my advice. It's probably a good idea if you have a certain kind of book that you love. It's probably that's the kind of book you should be writing. Mm -hmm. And so a good way to practice writing a story that you're going to love writing and you would enjoy reading yourself is to find the book that you love the most, the one that you've read over and over again and read it again. And this time, ask yourself as you're going through, you're reading it like a writer now, and you're reading it and you're thinking, what is it about this passage or this part that I love so much? What is it about this se section that I can't wait to get to? Mm -hmm. And then maybe try and use your own characters and write something similar to the scene that you love to get to, whether it's, you know, maybe there's a, a first kiss or maybe it's mm -hmm. this danger, action, or some other kind of relationship, or somebody's in, you know, unconscious, and you, you're like, they're, you don't know if they're going to make it or not. Um, try and, and just write a scene, but use your own characters that sort of mimics those scenes that you love so much in other people's books. Or for the flip side of that, um, sometimes I suggest kids take their favorite book and write fan fiction about it. So use the established characters because that takes the pressure off creating all new people and put them in different situations. So both things, what Lisa suggests and this suggestion are sort of two sides of the same coin, um, but will teach you different things. Definitely. And very lastly, what would you tell to somebody if somebody came up to you and said hey you are an author what what is the benefits of reading in general why should i keep reading well i think reading makes you smarter you know the more you read the more you learn about the world it allows you to visit places you might never be able to go on your own yes uh, it allows you to see situations that you might not be in or ever be in. Um, it allows you to understand people who are different from you. I think I've taken all of the answers. So. All, all of the excellent answers. That's okay. No, it's, um, you know, just to expand on that, um, building empathy um, and learning about other people that aren't like you. Um, but to see the commonalities, we're all, we're all, we all want the same things. We all want to belong. We all want to be loved. We all want to make our own way and be respected. Um, but not everybody looks like us or acts like us or goes to the same place to pray or eats the same food, but yeah. you know, deep inside we're all the same and, and building empathy through books is the best, best, best way uh, to learn about yourself and other people. And I have to say, Joanne, I learned so much from Sorry for Your Loss, um, just about the different traditions um, in Jewish culture and in funerals. And that was something so new to me. 
even though you and I have been friends forever, I didn't know a lot of the details. Um, yeah, neither did I. I also learned a lot from that. Did you? Yeah. Wasn't it so fascinating? And all the reasons behind what, um, you know, the rituals are, I just found so comforting and beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And, and I learned a whole lot um, in researching the book, too. I mean, the thing that I, that I think is most comforting um, about that is that the utmost respect in treating the deceased person in the body. And, and it's just such a, a nice thing. Like so many of the, of the rituals aren't religious per se, but just respect based, you know, and learning that kind of thing about different cultures is a great reason to read for sure. Thank you for the compliments. Thank you. Well, again, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you for coming out here spending this hour with me. I really, I had a lot of fun. I was really, really shocked when you guys said that you would be able to do the interview. And I'm just, I'm really, really grateful that I was able to spend an hour with you guys. Well, we were glad to do it. And we just found your other videos that you've done so enlightening and really great. So good job. Keep up the great work. Absolutely. Yes. Very engaging. And thank you for your really, really smart and thoughtful questions. This has been a pleasure, truly. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this video. I will see you guys in the next one.